Between April 7 and July 15, 1994, up to a million people were killed in Rwanda in a mass slaughter unprecedented in modern history. It is estimated that 800,000 people were killed in the first six weeks, five times the rate of the Holocaust. Approximately one-fifth of the country's total population was murdered. The majority of the victims were Tutsis and the majority of the perpetrators were Hutus. This was a genocide, a coordinated effort to exterminate an entire population. The Tutsi minority was historically the ruling caste, controlling the monarchy, the army, and the administration. The Hutus, who made up 84% of Rwanda's population, were furious. The Tutsi-dominated Rwanda Patriotic Front rebels invaded northern Rwanda from neighboring Uganda in 1990. The RPF's success prompted President Juvenal Habyarimana, a Hutu, to sign an agreement with them to end years of civil war and share power. However, Habyarimana was slow to implement the plan and a transitional government never got off the ground. On April 6, 1994, a rocket attack brought down a plane carrying Habyarimana and Burundi's president, Cyprien Ntayamira. After Habyarimana's death, a 99-day orgy of violence erupted, primarily by Hutus against Tutsis and moderate Hutus. Hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered by hand and with household items like knives, hammers and machetes. The Tutsis were killed in churches where they had sought protection. Finally, in July, the RPF, led by Paul Kagame, captured Kigali and approximately 2 million Hutus fled to Zaria now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thousands of these refugees, including those responsible for the massacres, died from dehydration and cholera. The West largely stood by and watched what was going on. In February 1994, diplomatic messages warned the United States, Britain and the United Nations of an impending new bloodbath, but no action was taken. The UN eventually agreed to increase its troop contingent to 5,000, but they were not deployed until the killing had stopped. Prior to the establishment of colonial rule, before Rwanda became an independent nation, Two main ethnic groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus, existed in peace and harmony. Rwanda also had the Twa ethnic group, which consisted only a tiny part of the country's population at the time. The Hutus were the major and biggest ethnic group in Rwanda, with approximately 85% of the population. On the contrary, the Tutsis made up roughly 14%, while the Twa ethnic group made up the remaining 1% of the country's population. Some historians assume that the Hutus and Tutsis migrated to Rwanda from different lands. The Hutus were from West and South Africa, while the Tutsis came from East and North Africa. However, despite their different origins, they united seamlessly and created their own single civilization. During the pre-colonial period, both ethnic groups lived together. In fact, they intermarried, had the same religion, and mostly spoke the same language. However, the two ethnic groups were largely differentiated based on their occupation. While the Hutus were farmers, the Tutsis were cattle rearers. This difference in occupation was referred to as original inequality between the Hutus and the Tutsis because cattle rearing had a higher value in Rwanda than farm produce. Hence, their political power and status were determined by their occupation. As a result of the higher value placed on cattle, the Tutsis, although smaller in population, when compared to the Hutus, wielded both economic and political powers. The First World War, which lasted for a period of four years, between 1914 and 1918, saw the winner states of the war establish the League of Nations. 
At the time, the people of Rwanda were under the rule of the Germans. However, the League of Nations evacuated the Germans from Rwanda and gave the country up to the authority of Belgium. Belgium had a basic colonial policy which was divide and rule, and they tried to polarize the Hutus and the Tutsis after they settled in Rwanda. The Belgians rapidly recognized the superiority of the Tutsis over the Hutus and went on to separate them. This separation was largely due to their physical appearance. According to the Belgians, the Tutsis looked more like European people than the Hutus, and this determined the status quo of the Tutsis in Rwandan society. Also, after a careful study of the bone structure and facial appearance of both ethnic groups by Belgian scientists, they concluded that the Tutsis were born nobler, while the Hutus were born to serve them. The Tutsis were the minority and were given preferential treatment while the Hutus were not considered an original ethnic group in Rwanda. To sum it up, the Belgians took sides with the Tutsis and began exploiting the Hutus. The straw that broke the camel's back was the creation of an ethnic identity card by the Belgians. This identity card, which included their residence and other information, created an abysmal relationship between the people of Rwanda, as they were labeled Tutsi, Hutu or Twa. This identity card eventually became instrumental to the Rwandan government during the genocide that was to occur a few years later. The nation of Rwanda gained independence in the year 1962 with Gregory Kayibanda, a member of the Hutu ethnic group, elected as president. He was, however, overthrown in a coup led by Major General Juvenal Habyarimana in 1973. Habyarimana, who was also a member of the Hutu ethnic group, became president. His regime was characterized by a plethora of unsettled ethnic and political tension, coupled with electoral malpractices and marginalization of the people of the Tutsi ethnic group. The Tutsi ethnic group went on to form a rebel movement named the Rwandan Patriotic Front in a bid to challenge the government and restore the status quo of the Tutsis. The Rwandan Civil War broke out in 1990 when the RPF, led by the current president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, invaded the country. The war would continue for another three years and the abysmal relationship between both ethnic groups continued to deteriorate even further. After a series of negotiations, the government of Rwanda and the Rwandan Patriotic Front signed the Arusha Peace Agreement or the Arusha Accord on August 4, 1993. Following the signing of the peace agreement by both parties involved, the UN deployed the United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda, UNAMIR, led by General Romeo Dalayer to Rwanda in order to ensure that they were able to keep the peace and security of the nation. This proved ineffective as the UNAMIR were inadequately equipped to warrant efficient operation in a time of need. The Second World War, which lasted about six years, from 1939 to 1945, witnessed the gruesome killing of an estimated 40 to 50 million people. It is regarded as the deadliest military conflict in history. This event led to the formation of the United Nations in the year 1945. The United Nations is saddled with the responsibility of maintaining international peace and security, developing friendly relations among nations and promoting social progress, better living standards and human rights. There are 193 member states and each of these states expresses its views through the various systems that are in place in the United Nations. These systems include the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, as well as several other bodies and committees. Although best known for peacekeeping, peace building, conflict prevention and humanitarian assistance, the United Nations and its system work on a broad range of fundamental issues such as sustainable development, environmental and refugees protection, disaster relief, 
counter-terrorism, disarmament and non-proliferation, promotion of democracy, human rights, gender equality and the advancement of women, governance, economic and social development and international health and so on. All of these fundamental issues are worked on by the United Nations in order to achieve its goals and coordinate efforts for a safer world for this and future generations. It is on the basis of these purposes that it can be said, as a matter of fact, that the United Nations failed the nation of Rwanda in the 1994 genocide that witnessed the killing of about 800,000 people in a span of 99 days. According to the 1948 Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, known as the Genocide Convention, genocide is defined as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group the conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. On April 6, 1994, President Juvenal Habyarimana and the President of Burundi, Cyprien Ntaya Mira, flew back into Rwanda after a sub-regional summit under the auspices of the facilitator of the Arusha Accord process, Tanzania's President Ali Hassan Nwinyi. The talks had been a success and President Habyarimana had committed to the implementation of the Arusha Agreement. However, he would not leave to see to this commitment. At approximately 8.15 p.m. East African time, according to the UNAMIR's reports to the UN headquarters, the aeroplane on which Habyarimana, Tayamira, other notable officers and several French troops were on was shot down as it was about to land in Kigali. The current president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, has been accused of being the brain behind the bombing of the plane. Everyone aboard the plane was killed. The crash reignited the war. A frenzy of political massacres ensued, starting with the killing of the prime minister, Agathi Uwilingi Yimana. She was shot at the back of the compound where she had scuttled to for safety. Also, the vice president of the Liberal Party and Minister for Labor and Social Affairs, Landuald Ndasingwa, was also killed. He had been guarded by the UNAMIR for months. However, on the morning of April 7, 1994, about 20 members of the presidential guard stormed his home armed with light weapons. After a thorough search of the house, they shot Ndasingwa, his wife, mother and two children. In addition to the killing of the Prime Minister and the Vice President, Judge Joseph Kavarunganda, who also had Unamur guards, was abducted from his home. His family was beaten and maltreated mercilessly. There was also the tragic killing of Belgian peacekeepers. This singular act caused the Belgians to withdraw their troops from Rwanda. This would prove costly to the UN and especially the UNAME led by Romeo Dallaire. Dallaire would go on to describe the withdrawal of the Belgian troops as a terrible blow to the mission. The Rwandan genocide came as a result of the ethnic division between the Hutus and the Tutsis. It is perhaps one of the most intensive killing campaigns to take place in human history after the Second World War. France made an offer to the Security Council of the UN to conduct a multinational operation to assure the security and protection of displaced persons and civilians at risk in Rwanda. This offer came after talks to expand the mandate of the UNAMER began. The objectives assigned to that force would be the same assigned to the UNAMER by the Security Council, that is, contribute to the security and protection of displaced persons, refugees and civilians in danger in Rwanda by means including the establishment and maintenance, where possible, of safe humanitarian areas. 
the French suggested the creation of a safe humanitarian zone. This operation, Operation Torquist, was led by General Jean-Claude Lafourcade. On July 17, the United Nations Rwanda Emergency Office liaison in Goma reported that over a million Rwandans had crossed into Zaire. This was a starting point of one of the most complicated and sensitive humanitarian agencies of recent years. The huge exodus of Rwandan refugees into Zaria, whose camps were to become infiltrated by the inter Hamway and other forces behind the genocide. On the same day, the force commander of Operation Torquis, General Lafourcade, requested Yuname to convey the message to General Kagame that if the firing did not stop, France envisaged an intervention by force. On July 18, the Rwandan Patriotic Front had gained control over the whole of Rwanda except a humanitarian zone controlled by Operation Torquiz. The RPF declared a unilateral ceasefire. On July 19, a government of national unity was sworn in Kigali for a transitional period set at five years. Pastor Bizimungu was sworn in as president, Major General Paul Kagame was sworn in as Vice President and Faustin Twagira Mungu as Prime Minister. Exactly 99 days after the start of the genocide, it came to an end, leaving behind a wake of dead bodies and scathing and deep-seated wounds in the hearts of many. The Rwandan genocide came about as a result of several factors, many of which could have been averted or prevented before the genocide got to its peak. The UNAME was created in 1993 and was charged with contributing to the security and protection of displaced persons, refugees and civilians in danger. However, and perhaps one of the major factors that led to the failure of the UN in Rwanda was the lack of adequate military personnel in the UNAMIR. The Secretary General, Boutros Boutros Gali, recommended a peacekeeping force numbering only 2,548 military personnel. Also, the poor quality and lack of capacity had a key effect on the way the mission dealt with the crisis, especially after April 6. The UNAMIR was not adequately equipped nor fully funded to take on the sect involved in the war. According to Dalayer, the UNAMIR mission was a peacekeeping operation. It was not equipped, trained or staffed to conduct intervention operations. In addition, the lack of clarity in communications between the UNAMIR and the headquarters regarding which rules were in force contributed to the failure. The draft set of rules of engagement submitted by the force commander of the UNAMIR was never responded to. In any peacekeeping mission, the unity of command signifies a vital component for eventual success to be realized. Individual contingents are supposed to act consistently in response to the commands from the force commander rather than the state agenda and imperatives. After the bombing of the presidential plane, nations like Belgium began to withdraw their troops from Rwanda. This was not supposed to be. They were supposed to get a directive from the force commander before acting out on their own terms. Furthermore, the failure of the UN in recognizing swiftly the events in Rwanda as genocide led to the overall outcome of the events. The inability of the UN and its systems to respond rapidly to the events in Rwanda portrayed the weakness of UNAMIR's mandates. In addition to this, the UN failed to take up the information sent to them severally as regards the happenings in Rwanda. For instance, Major General Dallare had sent a cable informing the UN headquarters of the gravity of the situation in Rwanda. However, this was not fully and swiftly responded to. Another reason for the main failure of the international community in Rwanda was the lack of political will to give UNAMIR the personnel and material resources the mission needed. For weeks, the Secretariat tried to solicit troop contributions but little to no avail. Even the very few African countries that expressed willingness to send troops did so with the provision that they were provided with equipment and that the UN must also be financially responsible for the troops. Moreover, the UN was slow to act in its description of the events in Rwanda as genocide. 
they would not clearly define the happenings as genocide until the Secretary General at the time, Boutros Boutros Ghali, described the event as a genocide in an interview on May 4, 1994. Also, some nations were reluctant to utilize the phrase genocide as they were induced by the lack of the will to act. The overriding failure of the UN in responding to the event in Rwanda in the year 1994 can be summarized as the lack of political will to react firmly against the genocide when it began, which was compounded by a lack of commitment by its broader membership to provide the necessary troops in order to stop the killings. On April 21, 1994, during the Rwandan genocide, the United Nations ordered 94% of troops to leave. However, Ghana's contingent of 454 soldiers disregarded the order and stayed throughout the genocide. By standing their ground, they helped save about 30,000 lives. While back in Ghana, their general Henry Kwame Aidoho met with President Jerry Rawlings, who scolded and questioned him about what he should have told the country if all their troops had been killed in Rwanda. Rawlings then asked the general what kept him and his men going during the genocide. Sir, there are certain things that happen in life that are unexplainable. We were in a situation where we had to act according to the dictates of our conscience. That we wouldn't die, we didn't lose too many soldiers operating. Under those circumstances, it could only be an act of God, General Ahidoho said. In July 1994, the Rwandan Patriotic Front took over control of Rwanda, except for the humanitarian zone controlled by the French-led Operation Torquis. Pastor Bizimungu was sworn in as president, while Major General Paul Kagame was sworn in as vice president. Faustin Twagiramungu became the prime minister. On April 7, 2004, during the 10th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan outlined a five-point action plan for preventing genocide. 1. Prevent armed conflict, which usually provides the context for genocide. 2. Protect civilians in armed conflict, including through UN peacekeepers. 3. End impunity through judicial action in national and international courts. 4. Gather information and set up an early warning system. And 5. Take swift and decisive action, including military action. The Rwandan genocide led to the death of about 800,000 Rwandans within a period of 99 days. It is regarded as the most intensive killing campaign in human history since the Second World War. We always have more stories like this to talk about, so don't hesitate to like and share this video with your friends. You can subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to receive the latest videos as they drop. Also, don't miss our next video on the assassination of Juvenal Habiarimana.